What up everyone, it's your favorite Brooklyn boy, Anthony Carano, coming to you live with Cafe Meets Coaches. This will be a podcast centered around contemporary physical education for the masses. We'll go over a range of different topics such as skill acquisition, fitness planning, and how movement plays a role in the development of mind, body, and spirit. My goal is to help bridge the gap between academia and practice, connecting friends, colleagues, and future professionals with the motivation to move and the knowledge to do so efficiently. As the title suggests, some of the shows will be recorded in person at a cafe. If this is one of those episodes, you'll hear some background noise in the podcast. Hopefully you too will feel as though you're there with us. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. <laughs> How's it going, Neil? Very good. So um, before, wow, that's funny. I usually, I just realized, I usually bring a deck of cards and it's like an icebreaker card. And uh, I just realized I didn't bring them as I hit start on this. So before I even do any intro or anything like that, let me see, I'm going to come up with an icebreaker question off the top of my head. I think the last one was, um, did you ever have a friend, or was there any ever a time that you had someone you considered an enemy but that you made a friend was one question you get to choose or two what was your favorite thing growing up on the playground on the playground or favorite thing growing up period anything doesn't have basketball. to be playground basketball obsessed oh yeah uh, one thing about my personality <laughs> when i find something i like i go all in okay and when i was young it was definitely basketball i mean were you yes. dancing then too? No, or? I was not. <laughs> no, again, dancing didn't come until my mid twenties. Okay. I was dancing was not something part of that was not part of my community. <laughs> okay. Growing up, okay, it was just not something that you know the, the music we listened to was mostly rock. Right. Uh, and then you know, early nineties hip hop at that point. Okay. But we weren't dancing to it. Were uh, you in Jersey? I yeah, know that too. In Jersey, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was just mostly rock music, pop music. So that wasn't really that danceable. Uh, so dancing was not part of my youth, but sports was. Okay. Absolutely. Because I didn't have, we had no video games, and I had no cable. Oh, really? So it was either read or go outside and play. Yeah. The only reason, the only reason my parents got cable, and it was when I was a senior in high school, was wow. because Italy was playing Ireland in the World Cup, what? and my dad was Irish, my mom was Italian, and they wanted to watch the game because it was going to be on ESPN, I think. Okay. So that's, that's the first time we had cable when I was a senior in high school. I grew up as a Brooklyn kid, yeah. uh, playing outside was a big part of it, but I, was, I did have video games, so. <laughs> I had no video, I, it could this be day, better, I don't know. To this day, I hate video games. Yeah. Because whenever I would go to some, my friend's house to play, they'd kill me. Right. Because I could never practice, so right. I'm like, this sucks, <laughs> so, I, right. so I just never played video games. To this day, I'm like, I have no interest in video games. That speaks to the importance of uh, positive association with things. Yeah, In absolutely. phys ed, we always say the importance of positive association with yeah. movement in early years determines yeah. if you do it later. Yeah. And here it is, if you have a negative association with video games, later on you don't do it, which is not a big deal, but yeah, movement, yeah. it matters. Movement is a bigger <laughs> deal. Yeah, yeah move, movement yeah. is a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, give us a little intro, maybe, you know, a brief overview of your career, where you are, what you do. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, technically, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, specialist, you know, CSCS. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a degree in history from the University of Maryland. Mm. Thought I was going to be a teacher. Then I realized in my senior year in college, I was like, I don't think I want to teach kids. <laughs> so I wasn't sure what I was going to do after that. Uh, I did IT work for four or five years after college, and it was the worst thing that I could have done for my body because I was sitting at a desk 24-7, not 24-7, but eight, nine Good. hours a day, staring at a computer screen. All the things that mess people up now is what I was doing in my early 20s, and I started to end up in really a chronic pain type of situation. Mm. Uh, and then my father died kind of unexpectedly at 65 Sorry years of age from a hip, hip replacement surgery. Oh, wow. And I then had a couple months later, I'm like, I'm really wasting my life doing a job that I hate. Mm. And some of my chronic pain, and I, some, of the, some of the pain that I have is plantar fasciitis, SI joint problems, neck spasms. Mm. Uh, it was everywhere, hip, hip pain. I, I really was very limited in my ability to move. Mm. I was so tight and so locked up. And just, I found a book in Barnes & Noble of all places. It was called Core Performance. And back then it was kind of revolutionary because they were talking about, he, the, the, the author was calling it movement prep and mm. then it became dynamic warm-ups. Okay. But just doing some of those 
dynamic warm-ups, my body started literally shaking. I couldn't even do them. I was so tight. Wow. But it was enough, and I wouldn't do that with most clients now because of my different perspective. Right, right. But they were enough to get my hips mobilized a little bit more and my plantar fasciitis, which is debilitating if you've ever had it, in both feet. I, I had it for basically four years. Wow. It was the most depressing time of my life. Wow. Because you can't stand up. Right. And if you can't stand, you really can't do much. So the pain was so intense, but the pain started to reduce. Mm. And at that time, I had already been to Brazil. Mm. I had seen people dancing. It seemed like a lot of fun. Going to bars was really boring at that point. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to take dance lessons because mm. I could finally stand up without pain. And I started taking dance lessons, and I was good at it. And they asked me to teach, so I started teaching dancing. Oh wow! I and then know. I started studying for personal training certifications because I was interested in my experience and how my hips influence. I wasn't blind to the fact that doing something with my hips right coincided with the decrease in pain in my feet. Now I understand completely why that happened. Back then I wasn't sure what it was, but. So I started to research personal training, uh, I was reading everything I could about anatomy, and so I became a personal trainer and strength and conditioning, and then I found posture restoration, <laughs> and that was where my brain went immediately, and it gave me a lot of aha moments like it does for a lot of people yeah. about how this asymmetric human body becomes patterned in a, in a way that produces dysfunctional movement. Mm. And that's that's what I do now is posture restoration. So did you seek out PRI as a strength coach, not as a physical therapist? Yeah. Uh, correct. Yeah. However, Most I didn't. People, so I yeah. yeah I had read about it. I, ironically, I had read about it on Eric Cress's blog. Okay. And probably Mike Robertson's blog. Okay. And they both kind of raved about it. Right. And I looked it up, and all I saw was about breathing. I'm like, right. Who cares about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really do anything with it after that. I, I, it was like, all right, fine, posture restoration. Yeah. And then when I needed continuation, continuing education credits, they were on a list of, you know, for the NSCA, for the CSCS, yep. uh, they were on a list of approved credits. And it was the, the myokinematic restoration course. And yeah. so I read the description, and it's about how the femur and the pelvis and the lower back all kind of work together. Yeah. And at that point in time, was one of the I was in some of the worst pain I had ever been in mm. because I I had such horrendous back spasms mm. that I was on the floor for two days, could not get up, mm. uh, and then I was left in such a tilted pelvic position. And I've mm. shown this picture. I, people are as amazed by this picture. But I, <laughs> every time I use this picture in any of my social media posts, like, <laughs> it gets a lot of views because I was so crooked. Right. That's how I was living when I found Pira. Right. And I said, well, I know I have a pelvis issue. Right. <laughs> I have a lot. And so I took the course. And the moment they said two diaphragms, not just one, right. and asymmetry is the norm, I'm saying, why is nobody Very talking intriguing. about this? Yeah. And I looked it up. And in fact, it, the diaphragm is actually two different muscles. Yeah. And once you see that you have a bigger right side and a smaller left side, and they both attach to the lumbar spine right. and the ribs, how does that not affect everything you do in life? Mm because it does mm. and my mind was blown and that's where I went and I just went deeper and deeper and deeper yeah. and then you learn about how all these different systems of the body come together to produce good movement or yeah. not so good movement yeah so Neil you're definitely smarter than me because I took about two courses and then I think I tapped out <laughs> <laughs> so well, the rabbit hole I can only go so far no, I mean, it's tough <laughs> and you kept going which is awesome but, but I would say the worst and I was thinking about this when I was coming in here yeah there were so many times where I would sit in a course yeah. and just be like, what the hell are they talking about? I, yep. I, I had to reread re read stuff. I'd get home, I'd put, the, the, I'd, I'd put the, the manual on the floor trying to understand what a serratus does and yep. a low trap yep. oh. in the pattern or in neutrality. And, I'm glad I wasn't oh, alone. <laughs> no, but I persevered because I knew I had to understand it. Yeah. And once again, like I said, when I find something I have to do, yeah. I'm all in. And, yeah. And, and, and the reality is, it just takes time yeah. and practice, and eventually you have your aha moments and things start to fall into place. I don't know, if you want to engage me in a biomechanic discussion, right. there's better people yeah. for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not going to tell you what the pelvis is doing with every. <laughs> every but, yeah. but, you know, that's. You really dissect I, it. Yeah, because I know from, a react, from, from dancing and from a sensory standpoint, the brain doesn't care about any of that stuff. Right. That's just. That's just human terms, human right. labels 
trying to explain a phenomenon of yeah. human movement. But the more you overly focus on a muscle, one particular muscle or one bone, mm. and from a mechanical perspective, you're missing the big picture yeah. of how of how that brain is moving that body. Mm. It doesn't know what a bicep is. Mm. It doesn't know what a femur is. Right. It's not responding to that. It's responding right. to sensory inputs, and that's what you have to understand. Mm. So, what would you say are some? I know that's a probably a big question, but some common malfunctions that are seen. So, you know, we said you said the right side, you know, there's some differences there. Yeah. What would be some common malfunctions that, uh, you know, the musculoskeletal system would encounter based on PRI's well, perspective? In terms of pain? Or? In terms of pain, or I guess I'm thinking, um, yeah, it's funny. You went on the journey of PRI, thinking about sometimes some pain you had in yourself. Oftentimes, I do the same with with me. Yeah. But um, so I know I'm very right side dominant. Yes. And I think about the join the rest of humanity. Right. Because, because we all are. Could this lead to overuse injuries? Absolutely. So yeah, I'm definitely yeah. Yeah. leaning towards pain. Yeah. And some people may be right side dominant and never experience pain yeah. uh, in their whole life. And Absolutely. then some might. Right. So I guess those that are experiencing pain or, you know, is it from right side dominance? Is it from not being able to stabilize on their left leg? Yes. Or, right. That's, that's really what it's going to come down to for the most part. Yeah. So right side dominance is completely natural. There's books written about this. Even if you're a lefty? Yes, because you have yeah. the bigger right eye. There's two yeah. primary reasons yeah. that are easily explainable. The mm. bigger right diaphragm. Every time you take a breath, there is more of a twerk there's more of a pull from the bigger right diaphragm on the lumbar spine. Mm. So if, you, if I took your lumbar spine and push it in one direction or another, the rest of your body will orient that way. That's, that's, mm. They talk about, what is it, uh, L2, no, no, L4, L5, uh, that area in the sacrum is yeah. kind of the, mid, the middle of your body. Well, that's where the diaphragms are kind of influencing. Mm. So where that area goes, the body's going to follow. So that bigger right diaphragm has more of an influence in the lumbar spine and sacrum mm. to the right that the left side can't compete with. Mm. So that's, that's a mechanical thing that's built into the way that we simply exist. Mm. But the other part is, and it's, it's fascinating, that both hemispheres of our brain pay attention. It has nothing to do with visual acuity, what your brain pays attention to out in the visual world. Both hemispheres pay attention to the right side. Mm. Only the right hemisphere pays attention to the left side. Mm. It's in the literature, that's not a PRI concept, but we use it right. because we know people drop off their left periphery and so we have to get them noticing the left side again. Right. But I would say those are the two biggest. And then the way that the hemispheres differ in their, in their function. Right. There's a lot of overlap, but there's also specialization, particularly the left hemisphere for speech mm. and how it, how it sequences things, mm. how, it pay, how it pays attention to sequences, mm. uh, and then emotion and all these other things like when you read the brain science, right. hemispheres simply aren't the same. Right. There's a lot of overlap, right. but there are some specializations for each hemisphere that will influence the way that we move and this right side dominance. Mm. And 90% of the world is right-handed. Mm. The vast majority will kick with their right hand. Right. There's a reason for that. So right side dominance is the norm. It's not a problem until something happens that you become so right dominant that you're no longer really getting on your left side anywhere close to appropriately. Right. And at that point, you start to develop uh, instability, particularly through the left hip, mm. and at, because you're never fully on it. Because mm. your pelvis never fully goes to the left. Mm. You'll put mm. your weight on your left leg, but until you can, now this is where you could kind of talk about biomechanics. Right. If you can't get that pelvis congruent with the femur. Right you're not really using your left side the way it needs to be used. Mm. And over time, as you play sports and you develop a lot of force to push forward, but you, on your left leg, you never use that left leg properly, mm. you're gonna start to overuse the compensatory muscles to help stabilize things, mm. which will be the hip flexors and lower back muscles on the left mm. side, and eventually the neck. Uh, and that's where things become dicey because you're gonna, the more you overuse those hip flexors and your lower back, it holds you rigid Mm. but not stable mm. and there's a difference as we were talking about before and and that's yeah. where the, so the more unstable that left hip becomes mm. the more pain is likely going to occur so i often talk about like yin yang accessing the spectrum it almost sounds like 
just having access to that left side. It doesn't have to be equal. It to will the never right, be equal. Right? And it, it will, will never be equal. equal. No. But having access to it and being able to access it uh, yeah. in some form of way, um, I think, would be the key there. Yeah. Yeah. With the appropriate muscles. Right. And we know, because you can, you, that's biomechanics. You can go there. Right. What are, the, what are the muscles that have to be used appropriately right. in left stance? You right. need a left hamstring, the whole, the whole complex, yeah. the left adductor, the left glute medius, particularly the anterior portion, yeah. and your left uh, abdominals, your left internal obliques. That's what's going to stabilize the pelvis on top of that femur as you swing the right leg forward. Yeah. And that's what we lose. Ever since I took PRI, I've always had it in the back of my head. And still, even when I'm doing dishes, if I'm having a conversation, if I, and I, I'm like, wow, I can shift onto my right and I can feel it. Yeah. I mean, I'm also an athlete who's right side dominant. Yeah. So I might even be more right side dominant than the average. Absolutely. And so, if, you, if you throw a lot with the right hand. Yeah, yeah I, I punch, I do martial punch. arts. Yeah. And, yeah. But, um, and then I go to shift to the left. I'm like, oh, it gets me so frustrated because I can feel the big difference. Yeah. I'm not able, like, I really have to focus to get like an adductor on. I have mm -hmm. to focus to kind of, like my foot is always kind of, um, you know, I don't know if the camera could see this, but I'm forgetting the term where you're- Supinated or Supinated, carnated. right? Uh -huh. Correct, supinated. I'm always, I feel like supinated on the left a bit uh -huh. where I'm not able to really kind of pronate enough to get the knee to line up over the mm -hmm. ankle yeah. and I'm kind of like pronating and abducting and shifting back and, and I'm like oh it's in my head <laughs> you're trying to get the sequence of events to occur right but something on the dominant side is not letting that occur okay it's not an issue of the left side not knowing how to work it's, the issue it will work it will work without a problem right. once the dominant side lets go fully mm. it's never about the left side working harder mm. it's about inhibition of the overactive of the overactive right side mm. and then there's one area on the particularly on the left your left lower and middle back that has to be inhibited also and right. inhibition is really a neurological process of the brain learning to not use something inappropriately mm. it's not about stretching you're right it's a neurological it has to resense how to be in a position appropriately but to do that, sometimes something on the right side is just not letting go completely because the brain is still saying, eh, I don't trust it. Right. That left hip, a little too unstable. Right. So I'm not going to risk it. I'm just going to stay over on this right side. Right. Which is, it'll work, but it doesn't work optimally. Right. It's still keeping you upright and you're moving forward, but not optimally. And that's the problem. And that's mm. when you start to have to use compensatory strategy. It's not, not something the brain is using a strategy. It's just mm. moving you forward on mm. a body that's still just over to the right too much. Mm. So when it comes to rhythm and dance, so a big part yeah. of the conversation I wanted to have with you today is around mm. that. Um, in a couple of my last podcasts, I uh, all, you know, often ask questions such as like, should people experience the world more than be in a gym setting and you know, things in that realm. And, but so bringing on the perspective of rhythm and dance, I saw some of your posts. It looked like you were speaking to the value of it. How mm. could um, dance in particular help to I guess maybe fix some of these common malfunctions or just help people to be better movers or mm. how does dance play a role in that so it is complicated it's actually very simple from a big picture perspective that the, the original the, 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 the human body is governed by rhythms mm. How we breathe is rhythmic. Mm. Our heart rate is rhythmic. Our hormonal fluctuations through the day is rhythmic. And they That's know this. That's a very good point, right? yeah. Certain times of the day, you'll produce more cortisol, right? Mm. Like, I think it's early in the morning. But it's, it's, your, your sleeping is rhythmic. Mm. Our brain, think of that. It, everything is rhythmic. Yeah. These are patterns. There's an up and a down, a left and a right. Sunrise, it's a wave. Sunset. There you go. <laughs> Everything, and our brain entrains with that sunrise and sunset. Now, mm. sunrise and sunset does not exist because mm. if, if you go out to out, out to space, that right. sun is going to be at you. You know, there is no sunset well, or sun. Right. You're just looking at the sun the entire time. Right. Right. So that doesn't exist out there. Right. However, our brain entrains with sunrise and sunset, 
because it's a cycle because of mm. where the where the earth is in relation to the sun but our brain entrains with those cycles of light and dark for sleep patterns mm. even nocturnal animals they just do it the opposite way mm. so everything in the hu- tidal the, the tides mm. it's rhythmic mm. it's wow. gravity yeah. is a, from the Making moon me think. Right. A fa- yes <laughs> everything is rhythm right. ups and downs lefts and rights all right so everything flows mm. You can't flow if you're only on one side. Mm. You have to have two to flow. If the body doesn't have two sides, you can't flow. Right. So if you understand that from a big perspective, the human brain, that the whole body is governed by rhythm, rhythms, various Mm. rhythms all at once, and the brain, the oscillatory activity of the neurons, Mm. is rhythmic. Wow. Different hertz, different speeds. All different, and uh, there's, uh, there's books written about this, but that gets way too complicated. Just the point that the brain is also responding to rhythms, mm. and it's run on rhythms. So the auditory system and the motor system are intimately linked. And I have a, I could just read it if I can find it. Um, oh, okay. All right, so this is from Gait and Posture uh, Journal, Whitworth, 2013. Music and metronome cues produce different effects on gait spatiotemporal measures, but not gait variables. I forget about the title. But he says, sound and human movement are closely linked due to extensive connections between auditory and motor brain regions. This is typified in the spontaneous synchronization of rhythmic, bo- rhythmic mm. body movements, such as foot tapping and head nodding, to rhythmic music. This connection has been exploited in studies using, using rhythmic music or simple beats to cue rhythmic movements, such as gait. Gait is a rhythmic movement. Mm. Any physicist, any neuroscientist will tell you if they talk about movement in the context of neuroscience or physics, of you know, objects that fall, they will say that it's planned, falling and catching. Wow. It's rhythmic though. Right. It should be rhythmic. Mm. But a pattern, someone who gets too stuck on their right side is no longer walking in a rhythmic way. Mm. That's what the left, that's what these patterns are. So if you can't get on your left leg appropriately anymore and your internal metronome is now arrhythmic, mm. You don't know that you're not on your left leg appropriately, but you're not on your left leg for the same amount of time that you're on your right leg. You see Mm. it constantly because you see left shoulders higher than right shoulders, Mm. no matter what foot they're on. If you go to your left foot, the left shoulder should drop and the right shoulder should come up. Mm. But when you're looking at someone with a higher left shoulder, which is completely normal, there's no way. If if you watch them walk and there's no alternation between shoulder height, Mm. They are not rhythmic. They are not spending the same amount of time on the left side as they are on the right. Mm. What happens when you're not rhythmic? Your extensor muscles will turn on. You're, all the things that cause us problems, the hip flexors, mm. the lower back and the neck, the extension fight or flight muscles will turn on to try to control that arrhythmic forward movement. Now you can't get out of that because you don't even know you're in it. Mm. <laughs> Yet, I know from doing what I do, Right. I can change all these ostensibly biomechanical tests like shoulder internal rotation, hip abduction and adduction tests. I can change all that by having an individual listen to music, 4-4 timing, something with a strong beat that can be counted easily 1-2, one, 1-2 two, one, two, or 1-2, one, 3-4, but 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, it doesn't matter. As long as they can time their heel strikes mm. with the beat, hip flexors are off, Lower back is off, neck is relaxed. I do it all the time. It's almost like magic. I even did it with someone who had one functioning eye, mm. and that's not simple. Wow. We were her. That one functioning eye is going to put her right back in the pattern the moment that beat goes away. Right. Which I showed in my video. I have a video on this stuff on my YouTube channel. Right. I was kind of shocked that it worked. Right. She called me from Connecticut. She's like, "You worked with my sister. I only have one eye that works. I don't know. I think it could help." And I said. I don't know, but we can experiment with music. She came down and it worked and I was kind of shaking. <laughs> like, I can't believe it's actually working. Wow. That we, yeah. we got her brain to sense something different mm. and her body completely relaxed. Now the problem was the moment we took away either the walking part mm. or the music part, and I'll go one step further, all she had to do was hear the rhythm and visualize herself walking to the beat. All her tests changed. Wow. She didn't even have to wow, move. Wow, visualize. She just had, yeah. She, all she had to do was visualize it. 
And I've wow. done this with other people also. I even had a friend who's a trained dancer, salsa right. dancer. All he had to do was watch me walk to the beat and he was neutral. Wow. Yes. That's Mirror wild. Neurons. Yeah. So what do you think that's uh, attributed to? It's, yeah. it's cueing. It's, it's rhythmic. It's, that's right. what the brain works on. Right. So this is so another thing. Uh, our brain does not... The, the way that our brain makes sense of space, mm. or, or makes sense of where we are in space, it's getting cues mm. from the visual system, from optic flow. So that's your brain... Set. It's not about seeing clearly. That's the important thing to remember. Mm. It's not about 20-20 vision. It's about where your brain is paying attention to in space. Mm. But also, as we move forward through the world, the world is passing us by. Mm. That's called optic flow. Mm. Our brain gets signals. Our blind brain, remember, the brain is blind. It doesn't see, like, you're not seeing me. Right. Your brain is guessing as to what I look like based on the reflection of light off of me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And then past yeah. memories, because you can't, your brain cannot, you can't process anything without past memories mm. and past instances mm. working on that visual system. So mm. only 10% of the neurons going to the visual cortex is actually from the retina. The vast majority is from other regions of the brain. Mm. So when the brain is getting these, these, uh, these visual cues, it's automatically being mixed with what is this? Where was I the last time I saw this? It's trying to put this into context. Mm -hmm. So most of the connections to the visual cortex are coming from other areas of the brain. At any rate, so that's a fascinating aspect. Also, right. It's really not yeah, about yeah. what you're seeing in that moment in time. Everything is being, it's mixing it with the, what it's hearing at the same time. You cannot separate sound and, past and vision. Experience. And past experiences, right. memories, threat. Right. Is this threatening or not? Or is it relaxing? Mm. Depending on what music you're hearing, it's going to be threatening or relaxing. Mm. If it's threatening, none of this will work. Right. I've done this many times with people. Right. Make them walk to music they do not like, they will not go neutral. Their right. hip flexors will stay on. Wow. Even if they are walking on beat. So what you like, what you enjoy, is huge for tension, for, for the, a decrease in tension. So it, it can't be just music. It has to be yeah. music that you like, because then you have to go into dopamine. Right. And how dopamine is from the basal ganglia is, is works with hearing. I can't remember what the original question was. Yeah, yeah. I went yeah. off on a tangent, no, that's okay, but all these yeah. things are part of it. Exactly. Um, and I'm okay with the tangents and wherever we go with this. But So it almost seems as though r rhythmic patterns are predictable. If something's predictable, Predi yes, that's it's it. comfortable. Predictable. Yes, it's predictable. So it, is it that the body recognizes rhythm as something comforting, in a sense, that it can relax? If it's the right rhythm. Right. Yeah. So right. If, if I had to listen, to, so different cultures. So this is interesting. So different cultures have different uh, structures of music, hmm. uh, and I'm not a musician. Uh, I've just studied a lot about music, but right. I, I don't know the proper music terms for it. But the scale in Indian music is not the same as Western music. Mm. So if you're if you're listening to unfamiliar cultural mm. uh, music coming from a culture. It's not the culture is that un well. The culture probably be unfamiliar also. Mm. But if the music is unfamiliar to you, your brain may not pick up the rhythm. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, and so it, your brain may have to work too hard to try to figure out that rhythm because your our rhythm our there's, and there's a great book called Your Brain on Music. Mm. Yeah, Your Brain on Music, and he just talks with scientists. He's a neuroscientist and a musician, and he talks about how our musical tastes are pretty much set in our younger years, definitely mm. by our teenage years. That's why when people, it's like, oh, for me, the only good music was in the 80s and 90s. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and for my parents, right. like, the only mm. good thing was in the 50s and 60s. Right. So, you're, and they don't really change. Right. Like, that's where your musical tastes are pretty much set. So if, if, if music that you're exposed to when you're, like, 45, if you're exposed to it for the first time when you're 45, and it has no relation to what your musical tastes were set at when you were, you know, in your teenage years, mm. it may be hard to either like it Mm. You just might not like it, or it might be hard to pick up that rhythm, even if you are rhythmic. Mm. So, it, 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 so everything I'm talking about right now, how it puts the body at ease, mm. may not actually happen. It actually might stress you out. Good point. So it has so to be familiar so or comforting music yeah, that it, that right. you find comforting. That you find, right. What two people find comforting and, and light, enjoyable may be completely different. Right. Yeah. So, what would you say this would mean, kind of practically? Should people incorporate dance into their routine like should they 
I don't know, do a Zumba class? Should they put music on in their room and dance more often? All of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's, <laughs> as long as you, as long as you like it. Right. Because what I, what, because what I've shown also in some of my YouTube channels or videos, is that, again, like I said, if I have someone who's rhythmic, a trained dancer. Who, who knows how to get their feet to hit with the beat, because mm. that's what dancing is. That's the interesting thing. Just walking to music does not work. Mm. Your heels have to hit. So heels, so if you put it in a pure eye or human movement perspective, heels give hamstrings. If you're a trainer, you know heels give hamstrings, right? Mm. Okay. If you do not heel strike, the hamstring will not kick in to turn the pelvis into the proper position. Mm. So you're... And that's not happening in a patterned individual, particularly mm. on the left side. Right. They're off beat. Right. Their heels not hit, their their heels not really hitting appropriately. It's kind of hitting in front of the heel, like kind of mid more foot. more midfoot, not completely, but yeah, right. just definitely not heel strike. Right. Not appropriate heel strike. But they can't get it to happen mm. when they're walking. They don't even know they're not doing it. I mean, they think they are, but they're not. Right. And so you test them, and they still cannot adduct their leg. Right. Which means their hip flexor is still overactive. Right. But the moment that their heel hits with the external beat, which overrides their own internal sense of rhythm, they're neutral. The hip flexors turn off. Mm. So you have to, if you're dancing off beat, right. then probably none of what I'm just saying will work. Right. So your feet have to hit. You have to have that tactile cue. So the brain gets cues, sensory mm. cues, optic flow, what it's hearing to orient you in space to figure out what what is that noise coming from over there? Mm. Where am I? You turn right. your head, so auditory cues, but also tactile cues, which will come basically from two main areas. Your feet hitting the ground, heel, arch, big toe, mm. but also your, the sense of pressure inside your own joints. Mm. If you can't get a heel strike at the right time, you're not gonna get a sense of pressure through your left hip. Mm. So they're linked, mm. but they can't get on beat. They don't even know they're not on beat. But once their brain links up a ta uh, an auditory cue coming from the music with a tactile cue from the heel, mm. that beat will put their heel in the right position. Mm. Mm. That's pretty wild. And they're neutral. The hip flexors right. are off. Right. So, so, so it's sensory, it's sensory inputs. And then the bending of the knee, the bending and the straightening of the knee as you walk moves your head up and down, which will be distributed. So you'll have vestibular inputs. And as that body is rotating and the head is slightly rotating, the semicircular canals of the vestibular system will also be functioning the way they should mm. be. So I guess, would you actually have people practice the heel strike on beat? I do it all the time. Is that what, so like you'll put on music and you'll cue and watch and say no more yeah. heel or- Well, no, they, I, I just how would that work? Well, so, I don't have to say more heel. Right. That, that, that beat will put them on their heel correctly. Okay. But this is the problem. Not everybody has a good sense of rhythm. Right. So I know if they're on beat. Right. Because I was a dance teacher for 15 years. Right, right. You know, I'm dancing. I danced every day in my life, literally for 12 of those years. I mean, okay. I was social dancing, teaching. I mean, there was no day that I wasn't dancing. Right. Or listening to Latin music, salsa, basically. Right, right. And I was... They, they called me the rhythm Nazi because I just heard <laughs> I everything so precisely. Yeah. And um, so the problem is this. Not everyone has a well-developed sense of rhythm. Mm. They, most people can learn it. They just don't. No one has ever confirmed whether they have rhythm or not, so they automatically right. assume that they don't. Right. But in all my time, 15 years of teaching, there was only one person that I taught for an extensive period of time who really could never figure out how to stay on beat. Mm. So everyone, not everyone, 99% of people, 99% of people, that's not an accurate number, I'm just saying. Right. The vast majority, the right. vast majority, because there probably are some people, there's probably some brain right. disorders, if you want to call it that, where their brain just cannot figure out rhythm the same way that the average person can. Right. So let's just say 95% of people have rhythm, Right. they just don't know it. Mm. Because it was never confirmed. Okay. But it's the vast majority of people, you t once you point out to them where the rhythm is, they can, they, they'll eventually get it pretty quickly. And when you say point it out, maybe they uh, can't just identify, tapping yeah. or yeah, mimic or yeah, like yeah. follow my, my tap. Or. Kids do it automatically. Right. You, there's, look up the cute YouTube videos of, little, of babies and toddlers dancing to music. Right. They spontaneously move to a beat. Right. Beat, 
beat recognition is there at an incredibly young age. Like mm. I think maybe before they come out of the womb. I'm not, don't quote me on that one. Right. But or very soon because your auditory system is one of the, is very um, is very evolved. Mm. Uh, more so than the visual system, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Right. Uh, at, a, at a young age, like the visual system has to develop more. Right. But the auditory system is is pretty advanced when you're actually born. My mom was listening to uh, I think Latin music. I'm I'm not Latin, but she yeah. she listened to everything. I think freestyle, uh -huh. cleaning the house, or freestyle, freestyle with yeah, me yeah. in the belly. So yeah. I'm probably getting that auditory stuff immediately yeah. from her. Yeah. Know, by in the belly. <laughs> it's 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 certainly possible. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're, but, we're just flowing. Yeah. But oh, yeah, so, oh, so they can't, okay, so what happens with people, they can't, I go hear a rhythm. Right. But when we're talking about it in dancing terms, we want people to be able to identify the first beat of a measure. Mm. So remember, our brain is, is breaking these random, so rhythm does not exist in the world. Mm. Rhythm is a human construct. Mm. It's a way to group, to mm. make sense of sound. Mm. So what we call rhythm is a mental construct. It doesn't actually, it, just like day and night doesn't really exist in the, in the right. universe. Right. It's a mental construct right. that we respond to. Rhythm is also a mental construct. And interestingly enough, people of different cultures, because of the language they speak, will hear rhythms differently. Mm. So there was a study on Japanese and native Japanese speakers and native American speakers. And they gave them the same sequence of beats and Americans were way more likely, or they did, identify one of the beats as a longer beat, mm. and the Japanese speakers would identify it as a shorter beat. Mm. Just be and they, they think it's because of the way the language, language has rhythm. Mm. The way we speak has rhythm. You know, preachers have, Martin Luther King had a rhythm. Yeah. You know, what yeah. makes people sometimes really moving speakers is the cadence of, of how they speak, the rhythm, the rhythm of their speak. Mm. Rap music is rhythm. Mm. Like they're speaking, they're talking. They're mm. not singing. They're talking, but in a rhythm, in a way that's very rhythmic, one mm. way or another. Mm. Whether you like it or not, because some of it actually makes people work. <laughs> I'm not gonna get to that. Well, yeah. no, I should. Yeah. Some of today's rap music, not the lyrics themselves, but the beats that are being produced. Mm. All the experiments that I do with people will put them into the pattern. Oh wow! Because the rhythms really can't be produced by humans. It's all it's all electronic, mm. and the rhythms are so not predictable mm. that the brain that I, that the brain has to work too hard to try to figure out when to step to that beat, mm. and it messes them up, and they they lose their range of motion. So oh, I wow. think some of today's hip hop music, regardless of whether someone likes, I'm not saying it's bad music. I'm right. just saying the rhythms that are being produced are very confusing to the brain. Right, wow. And I think are, might play a role in producing movement dysfunction in the long run. So uh, I'm thinking with my phys ed background mm -hmm. and activities I would do with kids um, or potentially, you know, the way, we talked about this a little bit before, but oftentimes people think of fitness, they think of, oh, an adult has to be doing fitness in a gym and all that. And I'm actually trying to broaden that horizon a bit too, yeah. that, you know, it doesn't always have to just be in a gym. So the things I would do with kids, I would also do with adults, is what I'm getting at here a lot yeah. of times. So, you know, I guess rhythmic, like what, what kind of activity, um, you know, just put on music and have them walk to the beat. Maybe yeah. let as them long choose as, as their As long music. as they're hitting their heels with the beat. Right. Then it will have an effect, yeah. And if they're not, Maybe I can get them to by maybe what walking with a partner. Would mm -hmm. I a metronome? People a metronome. If, they, if they can't figure out if they can't listen to music and figure out what the strongest beat is. Remember, we need people to, to find the first beat of the measure. Gotcha. Most four four timing, which most music popular music is in four four timing. Right. Waltz is three four, so it's like one two three, one two three. That that wouldn't really work. Right. We need twos and fours okay. because you have two legs. <laughs> right. Right. So four four timing fits the bill very very easily. Mm. Uh, but people, for the best effect, people need to be able to identify the first beat of the music, which is usually the downbeat, which is usually the strongest beat. Mm. And if you want to take it further, you'd want that to be your left heel. Mm. Because we know the right side of the body is already overly grounded. Right. So I want that left Strong. heel hitting with the strongest beat 
Right. Those would be the one and the three. Those are the downbeats. The upbeats are the two and the four. The downbeats you feel. Right. Boom, boom. So one, boom. two, boom. three, four. Left, one, right. Two. Left, yes. Right. So left, you're teaching right. your brain to ground stronger on the left non-dominant side mm. and less strong on the right dominant side. Mm. We're trying to lift that right side up and get that left side down. Right. That's how I would do it if I took it a step further. But just getting them to hit their heels with a beat mm. so that their brain is associating the music, the cue and the music with the heel hitting at the same time mm. is enough to get people to change all their PRI tests. Wow. And is there any other cue besides heel that you, like I well, yeah, think yeah, of yeah. a physical cue that you... Well, um, no, because you could do like a, just a basic side step where someone's just going like, so, like step, tap, step, tap. I call okay. it the universal wedding dance. Yes. People, the most step. people, that's mostly what people do. Most, pe most people who dance at a wedding or anywhere else, that, they're, just, they're going, they're going right. side to side. If you do one, two, three, four, one, two, it'll have very close to the same effect. Nice. It, I don't think, honestly, I don't think it will work as well as walking with the heel strike. Mm. It does work, mm. but it, it, I think it'll work even better with the walk mm. because it's, it, because it just works. Yeah, because it's a more natural of a pattern. It's I feel. more natural. Yeah, and it has one side of the body going forward while the other side goes back. Right. The two step, you're not stiff top. It's more. St yeah, yeah. Yeah. The walking. Because that's, that's the important thing about the, what's natural human movement. Right. Is one side of the body coming forward while the other side goes back. Mm. Your brain can make sense of that. Mm. But when you are keeping both sides of the body doing the same thing at the same time, and there is no alternation of that forward and back, which then means you can't really shift from side to side, and there's no transverse rotational movement going on, right. which is most weightlifting. Right, right. <laughs> it, it doesn't, your brain can't really make sense of that too well. It just kind of tightens you up over, over time. Yeah. So walking to music is probably the best, but dancing is the second best. I mean, it, right. Anytime you can get your feet to hit at the same time the beat is going, right. it neurologically is going to have an inhibiting, relaxing effect on the body, as right. long as you like that music. Right. We talked a little bit before also about rigid and flexible. I'm yeah. big on those terms nowadays. Yeah. Again, I mentioned that whole piece of like yin and yang and all that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have my martial art background. I often talk about that in the podcast as well. But I think about like a reverse punch, which is, seems like a very natural movement. You know, you have one side turning on, the other side is turning off or yeah. yielding. You know, if you try to drive a car with the gas and the brake on at the same time, that's a lot more stiff, that's a lot more rigid. When you're lifting, you're often super rigid. The yeah. goal is to almost have like gas and brake and be super solid. And whereas yes. now these, um, you know, activities where you're flowing a bit more, where your muscles are on and off and overcoming and yielding, one side's going, one side's, one side's coming, one side's going, um, which happens in a lot of athletic activities, but it's happening in dance all the time, is what you're saying. That's how you're going to rotate and turn, and, and something's turning on and something's turning off. Otherwise, you're not moving. Because you're getting sensory cues. Just right. remember, also, when you throw that punch, right. your brain is also sensing the ground underneath your feet changing. Mm. Mm. So it's not only that. Mm. Your, your feet, your, the weight on your feet will have to alternate. So you're getting alternation through your feet also, mm. just through rotation mm. of the punch. Mm. But the moment you put a barbell in somebody's hand, mm. they're not getting that. Right. Because you're imposing symmetry on an inherently asymmetric system. Mm. So barbells just extend you. Mm. For the vast majority of people who are not thinking in the terms that we're thinking of. Or are, are going to be patterned. Right. So, yeah. Do you think lifting, I know I had Mike Boyle on, he does a lot of um, single leg stuff. Like if you were lifting, would it yeah. be better to do like a rear foot elevated split squat versus a traditional back squat? With, from my perspective, right. without a doubt. Right. Anything, anything unilateral, anything that allows one leg to do one thing while the other leg does something different right. makes sense to the brain. Because right. it can compare. Right. The brain can only learn through comparison. Right. When you have one side of your body doing one thing and the other side doing the other, your brain can make sense of that because that's natural human movement. But again, right. just like Mike Boyle is saying, the moment if you do a squat, you have to extend. Yeah. 
if you flex, you fall. Right. So you're going to extend. Right. And that's that's one of the problems with the way that weightlifting has always traditionally been done. I mean, of course, no one was talking about this 20 years ago. Right. Or even 10 years ago, for the most part. It's only been in the past 10 years, really. Right. Maybe six or seven that PRI has kind of shown up a little bit right. in strength and conditioning and, and physical therapy. Yep. So true. take into account that no one was, you know, it's not like everyone was wrong back then. It's just that that was, it was never considered. But right. now it should be considered. We know better now. So, but yeah, anything single limb that allows one by to go up while the other goes down. So if I shoulder press with a dumbbell, my right shoulder will go up quite naturally my left side will go down. Right. That's move, that's that's normal human walking. Right. So anything that can keep one side of the body going forward, which will have rotation. Right. And down and up, those are all vestibular signals. Right. Which the brain can make sense of. But the moment two sides are doing the same thing. Right. That's not how humans move. Mm. So it's imposing tension on that system. Which I think it's important to also keep in mind different people with different goals. Mm. Like if you are a bodybuilder yeah. uh, and you want to build mass and that is your goal, there are some things that will help you achieve that that also might take you away from health. Yeah. So I think when we say um, better, we're talking about health yeah. because if your goal is mass, yeah. maybe it's not as much, you know, it's not right. better, right? right. right. But. Um, so I guess when we say better, we're talking about health. I just want to like, you know, bring that point yeah. and to realize it's that very, it's very, it's completely subjective. Yeah, yeah, right. It depends on the context of what we're talking about. Right, and um, and to know that certain goals sometimes take away, you know, you make sacrifices for it. Yeah, uh, you make a sacrifice for your health um, when you're trying to be really the greatest in anything. Yeah, or maximize on anything. Yeah, uh, max, you know, to be elite, you cannot be with the masses, you know, general right. is health and, you know, being alone at the top is not as healthy and right. you know, sometimes we forget that, but, you know, just stressing that point there. Mm. Um, but another interesting one, I, so I was thinking about this in PRI a long time ago and curious your thought, skateboarding with the left foot on the board. Yeah. Oh, Could that potentially... I, so, I was just, I was just having, uh, doing an online consultation with someone in Germany, and he, mm. he used to skateboard all the time, and he showed me, he actually showed me like how he's on the skateboard and how he would kick, mm. and so I think, yeah, it could probably be something good, mm. because it's when your left leg, if you're kicking with the right and the left leg is elevated on the board, mm. your brain is getting a sense of difference between what the right leg is doing and what the left leg is doing. Mm. The only thing is if you're on that left foot and all your sensory awareness, whether you know it or not, is more towards the front of the left foot rather mm. than the heel, mm. that'll be the difference. Mm. So I just had a sprinter yesterday that I was working with and he's, he's from the UK. He actually lives in New Jersey at this point, but apparently he was almost qualified for the Olympics. He was so close to neutral. I was kind of astounded. Wow. Before he'd never done any PRI before. And so I at one point I asked him to show me his sprinting start. And he and his start was with a left leg forward and a right foot back. So his right big toe was pushing into the ground, which mm. we know we need to be able to push through our right big toe to get to our left side effectively. Mm. And the way that he was on that ground, he was essentially shifted into his left hip. Mm. The only thing he didn't have was his left heel. Mm. That's his a weight good was on point. his toes. So what I did was, I said, okay, do the same stance, but I want you to put your awareness on your heel. He did that, I said, take a breath in, he took a breath in, I laid him down again, he was neutral. Mm. So emphasizing that heel is a oh, big part. Huge. Yeah. And you'll know you have heel. So this is interesting, because now I'm thinking back to yesterday. If my quad is burning, that's <laughs> you don't a have sign a heel. that you don't have, <laughs> you don't a, have heel. a heel. Yeah. Your, yeah. your hamstring should be burning. Or, yeah. or, or something posterior, glute, 
right? Yeah, or? well, you shouldn't overfeel your quad. Let's just put it that way. Right. You should feel more, not symmetrical, but it shouldn't be over, your, your quad should not be overburdened. Let's right. put it that way. You'll, you might feel it still, but right. But the problem is the position of the pelvis Right. that's making that quad overwork. But that is what we call the left AIC. That's, not, I don't call it, that's what or postural PR. restoration calls. the left. Yeah. That's exactly it a left quad that, and hip flexor that are overworking to stabilize that left side. Mm. So yeah. That's gold. Uh, so some of the tests, so you're saying that you know someone came up neutral. Yeah. Um, I know you know we can't obviously get it, but just to get a little idea, what are some of those tests you're talking about? So in, in posture restoration you're using uh, tests of leg and shoulder mm. primarily range of motion, but not in order to establish how much range of motion the shoulder and the legs have, although you are doing that, but it's to ascertain the position of the pelvis and the rib cage, mm. whether that pelvis is resting in a neutral position, which mm. would be more centered, or in a patterned position, which would be more oriented to the right, mm. because we're, we're not symmetrical. Right. And that asymmetry leads to a very unbelievably predictable outcome of this testing, and you mm. see it all the time. You don't see it the other way. Mm. That's what people say. So not everybody can be like that. Well, they are. Right. Uh, that's why this tier I think exists. Right. Right. So, uh, so when a person is in this pattern, you'll find very predictable limitations in range of motion mm. because of the position of the pelvis and the rib cage that are preventing that range of motion. Mm. Someone who cannot internally rotate a shoulder, they don't need to do a sleeper stretch. Right. It's the rib cage that's preventing that shoulder from internally rotating. Right. Once you get that system more straight, they'll have full range of motion immediately without right. touching the shoulder. Right. So that's what I'm saying. So those types of tests mm. will change very, very quickly. So Not for every single person. Right. But depending on the person, but they will change. Most of those tests will change with the way I described it, unless they have something going on with their visual system. Anything cranial, anything that's going on in the cranium, like a, a non-functioning visual stuff, like someone whose visual system is not being used appropriately, mm. not, they might not even know, that's the thing. Mm. Uh, a jaw that's not positioned properly, someone who's missing teeth. All that stuff is, are things that the brain really prioritizes, mm. and it will hold you tight to protect you. Mm. And then the stuff that I'm talking about doesn't work quite as well. Mm. But it can still work, but they're not, it's not going to be all they need. They're going to, it's more complicated than that, let's put it that way. So it would be position more than flexibility. Absolutely. And would you say that makes us rethink how we warm, do warm-ups and all those it things? It should. <laughs> I don't think it is. Right. I don't think for the vast majority of so would you teams or any or individuals it is. Only people that have been exposed to PRI, it does change their perspective, but they're right. generally the only person that's doing things a little bit differently. It's making me almost think uh, the best warm-up might be walking to music. It is by far the best warm-up, as long as you enjoy the music. <laughs> There's nothing else that will change your range of motion wow. the way that does. Stretching is not going to change a thing. Right. Stretching is dumb in a sense. Now, I'm not saying it's dumb to stretch, but I'm saying it doesn't, tell, it doesn't teach the brain anything new. You're tight because your brain is saying stay tight. Right. Now, there are some anatomical considerations in terms of how you know, people have different shapes of their acetabulum. You know, there's, there are some limitations in our skeletal structure, depending on the person. Right. There's also genetics. Right. Right. But leaving that aside, the vast majority of people, they have limited ranges of motion because the brain is saying it is too fearful to let you move. Right. Right. Because of instability and inability to breathe without, without losing the neck, inability to diaphragmatically breathe, all the stuff that right. posture restoration talks about. But people's straight leg raises, their hamstrings change 40 to 50 degrees right. just by getting a right glute and a left hamstring into their life. Right. And we didn't stretch a thing. Right. Yeah, which you know, makes me think, right, and like over-exaggerating a bit. But if I'm like super tilted this way, and now I'm trying to raise my right arm up, I, the camera actually could still see me, which is good. Like, I'm clearly going to be limited in that range of motion, whereas now once I'm able to shift back, I could get the arm up that's, a little higher. Yeah. And long story short, that's what it's getting at. But if you're training flexibility, you can be here and stretch that arm, but you're actually stretching it into overcompensation. Yeah. I, right. Yeah. How, I don't even, yes. You could be stretching things that don't, that 
can't be stretched, first of all. Right. That's why I'm so against chin tucks. Right. But <laughs> right, that's, right. That's, that's something different. Right. Uh, but you could be stretching something and further destabilizing yourself mm. or causing tissue damage because that length, that range, the, the position that your body in is in mm. is limiting that range of motion. You just don't know it. You don't mm. know it's a position issue. Mm. You think you're just tight. You're not tight. Your brain is saying, stay in this position. Right. Because that's where you've been for the past five years. Right. And I don't know how to get out of this position. Right. Put music on, your brain finds a left heel, finds the ground underneath that left. Oh, I'll shift to the left. Why don't you tell me? Mm. I hadn't felt a left heel in five years. <laughs> uh, now, now I got full range of motion in this right shoulder because my body just shifted back to a more neutral state. Right. You could put a different pair of glasses on somebody. That body will shift because right. their brain was not perceiving space the same way. It's a neurosensory system. Any, any, uh, what are they called? Um, any, well, any neuroscientist, but an occupational therapist. I have a friend in LA, she's an amazing occupational therapist. What she always tells her people, sensory precedes motor. We are not dealing with primarily a motor system. We are dealing with a neurosensory system that produces motor outputs. Hmm. When you don't have the motor output that you're looking for, working on the muscle is not gonna change it. Hmm. You have to change the input or how your brain is sensing those inputs, or not sensing the inputs, or sensing the input too much of on one side and not enough on the other side. Mm. It's, so a, it's an input issue and a processing issue that's producing the faulty output. Mm. Working on the output's not gonna change the input. Well, it could a little bit, but not in the same way. Right. Yeah, because I remember this guy, um, his name was Superfoot Bill Wallace in the martial art world, and he was very good at kicking to the head. He was known uh -huh. for it. And, um, you know, there was like a program where he said something like, oh, you stretch, you know, three times a day for three hours a day, you'll get your full split and all these things. But, um, you know, so not to say that like, yeah, if you're in a position for, I think, a long enough time, your legs will, you know, be able to get there, but it doesn't always mean that it's gonna be a healthy version Absolutely not. of it. Yeah. And, um, like you can hammer away at something unhealthy yeah. or, you know, finding that position. And then I think, you know, you could look in any kinesiology textbook, but there is a healthy range of motion that that right. joint should move. And, it's yeah. and there's exact numbers, you know, like it, it'll give exact degrees. Like yeah. this joint should move to this degree and to that degree. But is that on a dead person or with a brain? That's a good point, <laughs> yeah. Or is that on a skeleton, on a cadaver? Right. That's a, so they can figure out what's allowable by mm. how that joint is put together. But that's a dead person. So they're what not, would you say? They're not is living there? in New York City hearing sound pollution. Right. Do, do, that, do that same thing on this person that I play music that do, they do not like and they tighten up immediately. Right. And you'll be like, wow, I guess necks don't actually bend as much as we thought. Right. Right. Yes. And so though, once you, when you do have a good mover and they are functioning well, Will they move in that dead person range of motion, or even then still like? Even I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. I, I, I couldn't. And I, that's like yeah. not even worth. And who cares? Yeah, yeah, in my exactly. mind, like, yeah, in yeah. my mind, I, I think people get into these biomechanical discussions that don't really exist in the real world. Right. I don't care. Right. And they go it's, so far in a rabbit hole. Theoretically possible. Right. I see what's going on with my clients. Yeah. And I don't. They just have to have. They have to have enough range of motion. Mm. But this thing, I still have never found somebody whose range of motion has been limited because of lack of flexibility in some way. Right. It's a, they have a neurologically, a brain-driven lack of range of motion <laughs> that once that brain feels relaxed and they can breathe with their diaphragms and they can sense their hamstrings, mm. they know they have hamstrings, but you put their feet on their wall and you pick their butt up, or they pick their butt up, and they should feel their hamstrings in that position. It's called a 90-90 position. Yeah. Gravity's trying to push you down. You should feel your hamstrings. Yeah. Well, if you can't feel your hamstrings, what's the issue? Mm. That's a problem. Right. You should be able to feel them. As someone who couldn't feel them, I know what this is. Right. It's being driven from a neurologically tense system. Mm. I now have access to all my muscles that I did not have in the beginning of my journey. I couldn't feel anything. So it's, it's it was tension. Yeah. That was preventing me from feeling my body appropriately. Which is really turning on and turning off appropriate muscles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
and the underlying physiology like you were talking before. If someone is in constantly in a state of fight or flight, that activates extensor muscles, hip flexors, lower back, neck. Right. If they're constantly, that's why people in New York usually have the worst testing. Right. Because they don't, they're so accustomed to it. The noise right. and the pollution and the, you know, whatever else goes on in New right. York. Yeah, yeah. They're usually that PEC pattern. Right. Because there's just, it overwhelms the system. And so that's a big part of it, the underlying physiology. Like the music will either put you at rest mm. and all your ranges of motion change mm. because it's, it was a neurologically driven restriction. Mm. But once they relax and the brain is now saying, oh, this is nice. And mm. the dopamine starts flowing, which music does produce. It, music has the effect of the brain producing dopamine in response. Mm. That's what's so pleasurable about music. Mm. Things are much better. Mm. So how you're experiencing life will have more to do with your ranges of motion mm. than how tight you think your muscles are. The muscles really yeah. aren't the issue. Yeah. It's I everything it. except, yeah. everything else is the issue. <laughs> See, the other thing I like about this conversation is, and I felt a little bit when I first started learning PRI that you get a little lost in the clouds and I'm a very concrete person. Uh -huh. And I think this brings it, which I'm also an in the clouds person. I yeah, have yeah. pretty good balance and I think you need both. You know. But it brings it back to earth of like, yeah. okay, now what can we do with this? Yeah. And so it's nice to hear that, you know, well, just putting on music, walking, you know, getting that heel strike and uh, all that can help. Um, yeah. I would say it can help inhibit or turn off overactivity, inappropriate overactivity, mm. right? That's being driven by the nervous system. Mm. Not the same as stability. They would still need to learn how to restabilize that unstable left hip and get mm. onto that left side, and rotate the torso to the right without going back into the pattern. Mm. So I'm just saying this is a starting point, mm. right? It, but if someone were dancing their whole, the reality is most of my dancing friends, I have a friend, he's 65. Mm. He can dance, he goes to these things called salsa marathons in mm -hmm. other countries, and he'll dance for 10 to 12 hours, no problem. Wow. He does this consistently. Wow. He's dancing in New York three, four times a week. Right. And he never stops. Mm. You don't even see him. We go to an event, I don't see him for the next four hours. Mm. He never stops. Mm. He's rhythmic. Mm. He's 65, no pain. Most of my salsa friends never have pain. Mm. If they do, they're good in two sessions. Wow. Because they're not patterned very heavily. Right. Their bodies, I test them, they're in a, just a basic pattern. Right. They're not PEC, they're not tight in their neck. Right. The rhythm keeps them neurologically relaxed. Mm. Doesn't mean their life is perfect. Right. But on a physical basis, on a neurophysical basis, mm. their testing is way better than the average person who comes in to see me for pain. And what about the fact that they're most dance just kind of uses, a, I think, a little bit of right and left fairly equally. Does that play any role at all? It probably does. Right. Not, not by, they're not consciously doing it like that. Right. It's just, that's, to dance, you have to kind of alternate between sides for full ranges of, to, to fully express your body, you have to use both sides. Right. But again, the moment you step with the beat, mm. that beat is putting you on your left side for the full beat, mm. which you're not doing in your normal life. Mm. So, but, and I also say most of my, the dancing that I'm talking about, is I'm not talking about ballet, I'm not talking about things where they're going for what I would think would be, or I would consider an excessive flexibility. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about more about Latin dancing, it's also, that's my perspective. Mm. So, but the other part of, of Latin dance that's so great is the spinning and the turning. It's mm. all distributed. Mm. Most people, most people who have falls in the home or when they break their hips, especially in the elderly, it's when they're turning. It's during mm. turning steps. So I know from having taught many people diff many different ages, the older the student is, the harder it is for them to turn effectively without losing their balance. Mm. But I, since I've been doing this for like 20 years now, like a lot of people will take breaks and then come back. So I, mm. I might not see someone for a couple of years and they come back. Mm. They don't forget how to turn. Mm. They're older, they're five, right. you know, they're many years older. They might be in their 50s, they might be in their 60s. They're still turning really nicely. Mm. So if you learn, if you keep spinning and turning in your life, like kids do, you probably aren't gonna have these issues because your brain is still, it loves sensory swirl. Mm. It loves it. Mm. When you stop doing that, and then you get older and you start getting vertigo and things like that, it's probably because you stopped spinning and twirling. Yeah. And your brain can't figure out how to do these things anymore. 
and you've probably developed instability, and right. your breathing habits have probably gone in the wrong direction. So it, it can all coalesce to create problems. If you keep dancing in your life, and spinning and turning to rhythm, I know that if I spin somebody to the right, I can put them into the pattern. If I spin them to the left, I can inhibit all those same muscles. Mm. I've shown that on my YouTube videos mm. also. And do you compliment, so you did say dance is a good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, so do you complement that with some other, ex like so do you have them, someone maybe dance and then go to a 90-90 hip bridge or? Uh, no, so I don't like, have them dance. I, I will sometimes. Or no, what all, yeah, because they're not. To say, no, I didn't mean yeah, to say dance. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, they're not coming to me. To tell, they, they, like they, <laughs> people that find me, they're coming to me for PRI. Right. So that's what they're expecting. Right. Now, I think all my f initial sessions are an hour and a half. It's good because mm. I can make my own schedule, and I want to change their consciousness. I just don't want them to get better. I want them to, to change so they can take uh, control of their own lives. Mm. Because if they only think of it as exercises, I don't know if it, it, it'll work. That's not really what pure eye is. Right. It's a, a new way of experiencing your body through sensory experience. Every pure eye mm. technique is a sensory experience. Mm. It's not a left hamstring exercise. Right. Your, your awareness is going on to that left heel mm. and the position that your pelvis is in so your brain can link up a new pattern of movement. Mm. Uh, so I want to change their consciousness. So. I will often, because one of my intake questions is, you know, do you play an instrument? Mm. I want to know about their life. Mm. And if they play an instrument, excellent. Look at these ranges of motion you have now. I mean, walk, have you walked to this beat that you can easily find, and now look at these ranges of motion. Wow. But I don't understand. Just because I walked to a beat? Yes. <laughs> right. So, you know, I want to change their consciousness. So that's how I incorporate music. And I'll also show them for environmental stimuli. Mm. I'll show them how putting on music they do not like, which is just sound that they do right. not like, that they do not find pleasurable, will tighten their bodies up very, very quickly. And they're usually kind of astounded mm. at how quickly their body will tighten up when they're experiencing sound that they do not like. Because it just influences the autonomic nervous system. That's really what we're talking about, is mm. autonomous. So was there any specific type of dance? So you said salsa, for example. Mm. Um, I think that's the ultimate. Salsa. Because of all the elements, yeah. Yeah. All the, 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 the way the steps are put together, the amount of spinning and the turning, the revolving, the constant uh, optic flow because you're paying attention to the, the, the people who are dancing around you, whether you realize it or not, but your brain is. You're constantly turning and moving. So you have all this, all these sensory, the tactile, the beats. Mm. Uh, I mean, every area of your brain is being integrated as you're listening to the song. Mm. I mean, I have a, a list. All the brain regions involved in music and dance. Oh, here you go. Motor cortex, obviously, for dancing. Yep. The sensory cortex, so the tactile feedback of your feet hitting the ground, and the touch and feel of the partner. If you mm. dance with someone that you don't know, it's kind of icky, it won't have the same effect. Mm. But if, and every dance teacher or anyone who's dance, everyone has a different feel when they dance. Mm. And when you find someone who feel, it kind of sounds weird, but if they feel good when mm -hmm. you dance, mm -hmm. you want to keep dancing with them. Because yeah. everyone has a feel, and some people are just, they just don't feel good to dance with. Yeah. Right? Uh, auditory cortex. You're listening to the sounds, the perception, and analysis of the music. The prefrontal cortex, which is the creation of expectations, because your brain is always predicting and expecting a continuation of the same rhythm that it's hearing previously. Mm. That's how you know what's going to happen next, and then the beat changes, and you're like, whoa, what happened? Mm. So, violation and satisfaction of those expectations. And that's mm. where dopamine comes in. Mm. Music that's too boring and too repetitive, you tune out. Mm. And your brain's like, oh, I don't feel like. But mm. when, when the music is violated, when your expe expectations are violated, but not, too, not in a way it's too difficult for you to figure out, mm. but then you do figure it out and you get back on a beat, it's like, oh, I got it. Right. And you become happy. <laughs> just, right, that's just right. what happens. Right, right, right. right. So, uh, the violation and the satisfaction and the satisfaction of expectations. The cerebellum, which is involved in movement, balance, timing and rhythm, emotional reaction to music. The visual cortex, you're mm. reading the visual cues of your partner, leading and following, navigating the dance floor, which is peripheral awareness. The hippocampus, which is memory, so the memory of music, experiences, and context. Mm. That's huge. The dance steps and sequences, learning dance steps and sequences. Mm. The nucleus accumbens, which is part of the basal ganglia, 
emotional reaction, pleasurable or not pleasurable, to the environment, music, and dance partners. Mm. Uh, so that's dopamine. Mm. All right, and then just a couple others if I can find them. Oh, the amygdala. Mm. That's a tricky one because a lot of people are terrified of dancing in front of, or in mm. front of others because of that fear of public judgment. Mm. Like, oh, I'm not a good dancer. Like, someone's really going to care. Uh, so, but it's also part of the reward system. So amygdala can go either way. It could be okay. a good thing, but you have to learn. You can't just forget about it. You have to actively learn mm. to, you have to actively unlearn the fear. Mm. That's the important thing. So the more, you un, the more you dance in front of some pe people, little by little, or just go all out, you're no longer gonna fear the situation. Mm. You have to actively unlearn that situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to actively unlearn yeah. it. The frontal lobes, which are the, involved in figuring out musical patterns, the vestibule, so the inner ear, is, is stimulated by bass and drums, by low frequency sounds. Mm. The hippo, this one's a tough mouthful. The hippocampal entorenal complex, okay. which is involved in self-localization self and navigation. Mm. So for your brain to figure out where you are in response to the, in, in relation to that thing over there, mm. it's creating maps in mm. your brain. Because mm. remember, you're blind. Right. It's using all these cues to figure out where you are in space in relation to other objects so you can catch things and not bump into things. Mm. So that whole system. And then the activation of feel-good neurotransmitters. Yeah. Usually, as long as you like the music. Right. If you make me dance to music I don't want to dance, why would you do that to me? Right. You know, right. I go to a, uh, when I go to a, a wedding, you're like, oh, you're going to dance? Like, no. Because I don't like the music they're playing. Right. Put on salsa, yeah, I'll dance. But I, like, why, are you gonna, why would you want to, why, do you really want my neurotransmitters to, the, to be the wrong ones? Go nerd why would you make, real yeah. quick. You, are you trying to tighten me up? Why would yeah. you do that to me? Yeah. So, yeah, so as long as you're comfortable dancing to the music that you like, then you'll feel good at the end of the night. Yeah. Wow. A lot of, a lot of gems here. Yeah. Um, I guess is there, well, I did have one or two more questions, yeah. but you know, I usually conclude, or as we're getting closer to the end, ask, you know, what do you do for your workout routine? <laughs> so my assumption is you practice dancing and you dance. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, well, not as much as I used to, unfortunately, because it's just it's where the dance events take place. Right. Is, everything's too late. Right. <laughs> Everything starts too late, and I'm older. Okay. And uh, yeah. like, if I'm not out the door by at least 8 p.m., I'm not going out. And then most things don't start until pretty late. So I don't dance as much as I used to. So I mean, I do some hills and jogging and, and some, a little bit of weightlifting, but I don't go crazy Do you uh, work, workouts anymore. Right, I used right. to love to lift heavy. Right. It never made anything better in my life. Right. <laughs> but it was an ego thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's most... cool to lift heavy weights. I, you know, I understand it. Yeah. But now I'm 46, and it's like, oh, it doesn't really... Yeah. Mean much to me anymore. For me, when I think about it, um, back to that rigid, flexible, I think there is some benefit. And you know, there's some people who could be too flexible potentially Absolutely. and need yeah. some, you know, rigidness in their yeah. life. And yeah. if rigidness is a word, but, yeah. uh, you know, need that in their life and then vice versa and yeah. finding that balance, yeah. you know, if, and it could be, you know, as simple as if you're lifting weights five days a week and you're not doing anything that would be on the flexible spectrum of movement uh, yeah. any days of week, then you're probably too rigid, you know? Yeah. Like it could be a simple yeah. math equation like that. Yeah. You know? I remember they're probably sitting at a desk. Most people are, you know, working right. at a desk job and they're not moving. Right. And then they're lifting weights. But again, that's not... You're going rigid, rigid, yeah, rigid. Yeah, and then they go home and sit down and watch TV. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so finding that balance, you know. Um, was there anything you brought that we missed that you wanted to share um, before we start no, to close think, things out? I think that was pretty much it. And all this, and all, everything I talked about today, you can find in books. Right. Uh, there's many books written about the brain and music. Um, so nothing I said is like, right. not supported by neuroscience right. and, and science in general. Um, yeah, it's not. That's pretty. That's pretty much it. Is that the important thing is that you just have to enjoy what you're listening to and enjoy the activity that you're doing. So even something like cycling could probably be rhythmic. Mm. Tandem cycling, cycling with another person on these tandem bikes, mm. uh, because you will train with the other individual. Your brain is always reaching out to touch someone. Mm. It's always actively reaching out and it will entrain with something mm. 
and hopefully it'll be something positive and not negative. Because mm. when you entrain with something negative, that's why I always say like people who watch too much political TV or political mm. news, you can feel it in their bodies. They're yeah. rigid. Yeah. They're really rigid. Yeah. Uh, and so hopefully you can train your brain with positivity things, things that are positive, which will keep you in a much better state of mind and better health. But once you go down that rabbit hole of negativity, it can be difficult to pull yourself out and your health will suffer. So yeah. I think the most important thing is finding an activity, whether it's dancing or anything else, that you like. Mm. But that is not just feeding your ego at the same time. Mm. Because that's a that's that's not a good road to go down either. So if like if you wait if you like weightlifting, great. Mm. But if you only like weightlifting primarily because it feeds your ego of being big and strong, you're probably hiding something. Mm. There's probably something else going on in your life that you need that for. Mm. And that's never gonna lead you to that's really why I don't personal train anymore. Mm. Because it was just the same questions over and over again. Mm. of weight loss and, and getting bigger and they're, they have bigger things in their life to deal with and they're trying to, a lot of people are trying to use how they look as a way to pick them up but any spiritual tradition, any religion is going to tell you it's a losing proposition Right. you can never be happy that way because right. you're going to get older Right. right. <laughs> you know, you're, there's always going to be someone that looks better Right. so, you know, yeah. as long as what you're because even with dancing some people they want to be the best dancers mm. to feed their ego because maybe they maybe they weren't popular and now mm. they can do something. You see it a lot in dancing. Yeah. And ooh, they're real good dancers, they start getting attention and now it boosts their ego. But then they realize eventually, my life hasn't really changed. Mm. Nothing really changed. So you have to disconnect from the outcomes. Right. And not think of it in terms of, of, of pumping up your ego or you know, making your ego low or whatever it's going to be. You have to just enjoy the activity for the activity. I and love that. It, because otherwise, it's, it's, a, it, it's going to lead you in the wrong direction. I love you it. you got to be happy. I but if it's it. ego-driven, you're not going to be happy. That's what every... Have you ever seen E! True Hollywood Story? <laughs> like <laughs> right. all these rock stars and musicians and, right. and famous people, they have everything they ever possibly want and yeah. they're still ending up in rehab. Yeah. So that should tell you something about fame and YouTube fame or Instagram fame or... Right. It's not what it think. It's not what you think. Yeah. And the faster you can learn that, the more you can just enjoy the stuff that you have. Yeah. And then you know, I think about too. Just if you don't use it, you lose it. You yeah. know, you mentioned all those parts of the brain. Yeah. Like you think about how many things you're training, and uh, whether it's you know your physical body, whether it's your brain, and you know the first podcast I did was physical literacy, and they talk about how those are not really two different things anyway right. you know like yeah. everything is so intertwined yeah but you know if you don't use it you lose it and just dancing in and of itself is helping to preserve those areas of the body that um, that we would want to preserve for health longevity and healthy movement absolutely and it has a cardio respiratory effect because you know yeah. it's, it's cardio it's, yeah. it's, it's moderate yeah. uh, depending on how fast you're dancing some of the music is insanely fast and you got to right. keep up it's tiring so right. it depends on how fast the speed, how fast the music is, also. So yeah, there's right. really nothing that train that dancing does not train, right. depending on what dancing you're doing, obviously. But right. yeah, dancing is any type of dancing is probably better than no dancing at all. I'm trying to think of like a, a bad dancing to do, but I mean, I'd have to stretch <laughs> to, figure, to figure that one out. I'm sure there's something like doing the limbo, <laughs> like right, might right. not be great for certain people because of what right. they're, you know. But you know, but like a good and bad, they're just subjective terms that. Yeah. It can't apply to every single thing. Yeah. Different situations. So now I'm in New York City. It is a Saturday night. I think I'm going to go out dancing in a club. I don't know. After. Are you really? <laughs> I'm 34. So oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a little, you know, I don't know how old you, you can are. But I'm, you, I'm 46. You know. So you can stay out later than me. And I don't have kids. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm going to have to go out dancing tonight. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe you should do that. But you better find some place that's going to play the music that you like. Yes. Good point. Not always easy. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Uh, super excited as a physical educator, like I said, brought in the horizons, talking about dance and other ways to improve someone's physical health. I saw your stuff, you inspired me. I found you just really from Instagram for the most part. But um, 
you know, very inspiring and PRI has a rich history, so the combo of the two and yeah. after I started hearing all your stuff, I said, this guy's got some really good wisdom to share. So I appreciate you bringing it on and sharing it with all the people who watch. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks. All right, we'll close this out.